Hi, I'm John F. Allen. And I'm R.J. Sullivan. And we're the Two Towers. Greetings and welcome to the Two Towers Talk Show. I'm your host, Tower One, John F. Allen. And I'm Tower Two, R.J. Sullivan. So today I get to do the introduction. <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna shake things up a little bit because we're bringing on um, one of uh, one of the uh, a special guests that I'm super excited about, and John knows that, so he's letting me take the lead on this. Thank you, John. Uh, we oh, have wow. Greg Cox, uh, uh, New York Times best-selling author of all sorts of novelizations, particularly Star Trek and. All kinds of different IP, and if uh, if you think you've seen his name somewhere, you probably have, especially if you've been in a bookstore in the last thirty years or so. Uh, he is he wrote the official mo movie novelizations of War for the Planet of the Apes, Godzilla, Man of Steel, The Dark Knight Rises, Daredevil, Ghost Rider, Death Defying Axe and the first three Underworld films, as well as the novelizations of four popular DC Comics miniseries, Infinite Crisis, 52, Countdown, and Final Crisis. In addition, <laughs> it just keeps going, he has written books and short stories based on such popular series as Alias, The Avengers, Batman, Buffy, one of my favorites, CSI, Farscape, another favorite, Fantastic Four, Here's one that takes me back, the 4400, the Green Hornet, Iron Man, Leverage, the Librarians, the Phantom, Planet of the Apes, Roswell, Star Trek mentioned deep in there, but uh, we'll be talking about Star Trek quite a bit, uh, Terminator, Underworld, Warehouse 13, Xena, the X-Files, X-Men, and Zorro, and I'm sure that's not a complete list. He has received three Scribe Awards from the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers. Greg also works as a consulting editor for Tor Books, where he has edited such authors as Richard Matheson, a name I see him put up on his Facebook page quite frequently. I, I always love chatting about Richard Matheson's work. Chelsea Quinn, Yar, oh, Ch I'm sorry, Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough, Harry Harrison, Tony Daniel, Rosemary S. Edgeridge, Edge Graham Hill. Joyce, Keith R. A. De DeCandido. I'm sorry, am I saying that right, Greg? DeCandido. Okay, thank you. S. P. Santo, Christopher Bennett, R. S. Belcher, and many others. In addition, he has written more jacket and cover copy than he can possibly remember. He lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Greg, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to have you. Thank you. I, I'm excited to be here. So uh, for starters, let's get into some of your uh, recent releases. I am, I, there's probably even something more recent, but uh, the... Uh, Hello? You broke up, RJ. Original series Star Trek. Is that You're still the, the latest? Breaking up. You're, Am I breaking up? Everything that you said was not heard. So you need to start uh, uh, just after the introduction. Oh, okay. Okay. That's weird. I was hearing weird beeping noises here. Hmm. Let me see if I can. I'm really not sure what I can do to adjust. Is it okay now? Yeah, you're coming through clear now. Okay. All right. So let's, I'll pause briefly. <clears throat> so Greg, there may be something more recent, but some of the things I am aware of that came out recently, you had, you put out a new original series novel called A Contest of Principles, which I should probably be ashamed to say is the first actual Star Trek novel of yours I've read. Um, but I enjoyed it very, very much. Um, and it came out, I believe, October or November of last year. Is that correct? Uh, November. November. And it would be safe to say that this novel is about uh, 
the uh, the enterprise trying to ensure that there's no corruption during a presidential election. And I have to say that book actually landing in November 2020, it <laughs> was kind of weird. That was pretty amazing. I, I, it was messing with my head. That book ended up being a bit more topical than I intended or would have preferred it to be. In fact, if you allow me to belabor the point, just, yeah, you know, it was funny when the book came out, I, I started seeing reviews saying, oh, this book is obviously about the contested, you know, 2020 presidential election. I'm going, how fast do you think I can write? <laughs> you know? I, I, I swear to God, I wrote that manuscript a year before that. The outline had been submitted to the powers that be at CBS and Pocketbooks, you know, months and years before that. And indeed, the idea of the enterprise serving as election observers, uh, impartial election observers on an alien planet had been sort of sitting around in my brainstorming to-do file for, for ages, you know? Yeah. Well, that I thought that worked out really well. Actually, I I got a big kick out of that when I when I got into it. It was a it was a really fun read. Um, now I actually did the the audio book version because that seems to be what I've been doing in the past few years. I really have enjoyed audio books. Can you tell me a bit about your narrator because he uh, he really nailed the voices and really gave it that throwback feel that that made it very enjoyable. Well, I, I believe the guy's name is Robert Petikoff. I'm tempted to run over my shelves and look at the tape, but yeah, he seems to be the default um, uh, voice of choice for Star Trek audiobooks these days. And he does a really great job. And, you know, I, oddly, you know, sadly, I've never actually met the man. Mm -hmm. My involvement here usually is I get a nice note from the folks at the audio company asking me for a pronunciation guide of all the weird alien names or whatever that may pop up in my Star Trek books, mm -hmm. which sometimes comes as a shock because I have to sit down and go, oh God, now I have to figure out how they're pronounced. <laughs> I, I have learned my lesson actually. It used to be, you know, I had the embarrassing experience of, you know, oh, this looks good on the page. I'm going to throw some weird consonants together and it's going to be an alien name. Oh, and that's my kind of research. Say, how do you pronounce that, Greg? And I go, huh? I, I like to think, honestly, at this point, I'm a little more aware now that we are fully into the audiobook era of being conscious of the fact when I'm writing these books that some poor bastard is actually going to have to record this, you know. Yeah, right. My apologies, Robert Petikoff. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's my involvement is, you know, it is a collaborative process. They, invariably, at some point, they send me a list of names. How do you pronounce this? And I send them a pronunciation guide back. And it all goes very smoothly. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And because of the audiobook nature and the fact that he could nail those voices so well, it really almost felt like I was sitting in front of the TV uh, watching certain parts of it. But but to your credit, it was a it was a marvelously written novel. The the plot it was was very tight. And one of the things that really stood out to me is the fact that you set it deeper into the five year mission so that the characters had some in some growth to them beyond what we had witnessed on screen. I remember particularly a moment with Nurse Chapel. Um, Nurse Chapel and Mr. Spock are working together, and you make a point of pointing out that Nurse Chapel is kind of over Spock at this point. She's kind of gotten past that that uh, that you know probably uh, an aspect of her character that hadn't aged all that well and yet it was kind of what she's most known for and I like the fact that you pushed her forward and she's like okay that that was a thing but now I, I'm working with Spock and it's at a more professional level and I, I, I need you know she's moving uh, she moved beyond that and it made her a, a much more rounded character than, than we'd usually get a chance to see with her. My editor Margaret Clark and I were both very much on the same page here when I decided I wanted to give Christine Chapel a big part in this book that no, we weren't going to go there. That right. the, her hopelessly pining for Spock thing, you know, we, 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 we wanted to do more of her than that. So actually I make a point of in fact, 
establishing that very on, I, I think in the first chapter, the, the chapel appears that, you know, just to diffuse expectations that mm -hmm. since, you know, no, we're not going that, oh, you know, McCoy comments, idly, I think within about a few pages of chapel being introduced that he was glad to see that she was Oprah Spock now, you know. Yeah, right. Was not, just, that was sort of my, me sort of, indeed sort of heavy handedly almost sort of alert. Yes, we're doing Christine Chapel. Yes, I'm teaming her up with Spock. Don't expect, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, he's teaming up with Spock. I know that's, we're not going there. I'm just sort of signaling that to the reader very early on that, and indeed, it was fun. I, I, I admit that Chapel was a character I have neglected because, you know, 25 years of writing Star Trek novels, I've never really done much with Chapel before. She's been in the books, usually handing McCoy a laser scalpel. So this is the first time I'd really done anything with her. And mm. I was sort of gratified to discover when I mentioned this, that on fandom, you know, going to the internet, people were going, oh, wow, Chapel's in this book. Chapel's doing something. I, I didn't realize people were waiting quite so much for people, for, for, for you know, Chapel to be given something to do other than pine over Spock. Okay. There you go. And then also- and I, and of um, course I'm very excited now just to digress to find out the chapel is going to be in Strange New Worlds. So, wow, that's exciting. Yeah, you know, which I did not oh, know, yeah. time, which right. I did not know at the time I wrote that book, you know. Huh, that's cool. Um, so, um, I, I very much enjoyed uh, uh, the, the direction of that book. It, it's, a, it's a great read. Uh, people should, should check it out. Um, I want to give, before we get too deep into other things, I want to give you a chance to talk about anything coming out shortly, anything that uh, people should be looking for from you. Well, the most recent novel was indeed A Contest of Principles, which is the Star Trek novel we were just talking about. I, I've had a number of shorter works come out. I had a story in an anthology called Thrilling Adventure Yarn 2021. Um, I have an essay on Boris Karloff and Beta Lugosi in a uh, book called Musing on Monsters, which is a collection of essays on classic horror. And I believe as of like last week or so, I actually have an essay on the original Adam West Batman TV series out in a collection, in a book that just came out like I think the last week or so. Oh, it's very cool. Weird. It's, it's, I know John's a big fan of, of that as, as am I. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a series of volumes that are, you know, the first, first volume is about the first season, and second volume is about the second season. There's gonna be a third volume about the third season. And I'm struggling to come up with the title because the titles are all Batman sound, sound effects. I think the one I'm in is like, oof, bam, pow, or oof. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm mentally failing here as to which onomatopoeia I got, but I'm in volume two, which is, and I wrote an essay about the three-part um, episode where the Penguin teams up with Marsha, Queen of Diamonds, to film a movie in Gotham City. Spoiler alert, the movie is actually a cover for the crime of the century. So. Well, of course, isn't it always? And, and I had rather too much fun, I actually, uh, my conceit was I wrote a review of the movie that the Penguins directed, you know, as reviewed by the Gotham film critic. Okay, so. Oh, nice. Very nice. Beyond so, that, I've got various projects in the works, but nothing like it. The things are sitting on people's desks and, you know, waiting to be approved. Nothing you can talk about just yet. discuss at this time. Any, any, uh, any more uh, novelizations of that sort? Probably nothing you can announce either. Nothing I can talk about, no. All right, fair enough. Let's go back to Musings on Monsters, Observations on the World of Classic Horror. We're going to be coming back to your article that you wrote on this, which is entitled Boris and Bella, the best of, oh my goodness, I didn't even notice that, the best of fiends. Ah, I see what you did. <laughs> um, I have to say, um, I've read most of this book and uh, the, the various articles in here are very enjoyable. Um, there are some deeper dives into various aspects of Universal Studios that uh, I was unaware of, even though I consider myself well-versed on the topic. Um, there was a section on Dark Shadows, which was nice to see, another thing I'm very much into. Um, uh, you know, it wasn't the best of circumstances that I read this. I was uh, in the hospital uh, recovering. I was post-op basically i was stuck in the hospital for a couple of days but this book was was highly entertaining and i very much 
enjoyed your article as well as as many other things in here. So that is by Sequart Sequart uh, Organization Books. Uh, it's called Musings on Monsters: Observations on the World of Classic Horror, edited by Rich Handley and Lou Tambone, forward by Jim Beard. And people should be checking that out. But we're going to come back to to that later, uh, probably in the second second half of this when we talk about the raven um so let's let's uh let's dig back a bit let's talk about how you uh how you got involved in doing what you're doing and how how things became so successful for you um so john do you want to jump in here yeah um well i enjoy star trek a lot not quite as much as RJ, um, but I'm I'm a star, I'm a Trekkie nerd. So you know we the, we come in varying degrees. But the thing that really mm-hmm. interests me about you and your writing um, really has to do with writing science the uh, superhero science fiction uh, novelizations and novels uh, because that's of the greatest interest to me. And it's something that I have uh, uh, tackled, uh, you know, in my writing career. And I just wondered, uh, you know, could you describe your love for comic book characters and what it, what went into writing the novels based on them for you? I know some of them are novelizations, but, you know, from you as a fan and a writer, uh, could you tell us more about that? Well, yeah, I, I you know, you know, along with Star Trek, I grew up a huge comic book fan. I remember, you know, pedaling my bike down to 7-Eleven to get my, you know, latest comic books from the spin rack. I'm dating myself here and getting a yes. Slurpee and a bunch of comic books. Yes. Um, I'm old enough to remember when comic books were 12 cents a piece. I, I'm not quite old enough to remember dime comics, but I remember, you know, you could go down there and get a couple of comics for a dollar or so and a Slurpee. Uh, just this morning, Prior to this meeting, I was reading the 60th anniversary new issue of the Fantastic Four and enjoying that very much. So yeah, I was, you know, all of which leads up to the fact whenever I get hired to write a Batman novel or an X-Men novel or something, yeah, my inner 12-year-old is thrilled. Yeah, there's a part of me that's, oh yeah, well, this is cool and I gotta be, talk to, you know, talk to my agent and we gotta work out the royalties and stuff. But a part of me is like, oh boy, I actually am getting paid to write Ghost Rider I'm getting paid to write Wonder Woman, et cetera, which is, I grew up on this stuff. I, you know, know it backwards and forwards, um, you know, hit the comic book store every Wednesday. Um, hello to the comic book store here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's called the comic store. Okay. Uh, there you go. On McGovern Street. Okay. Um, Growing up in Seattle, I hit Golden Age collectibles down in the Pike Place Market. So yeah, I, 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 you know, I remember watching the original Batman Adam West TV series on its original run and thinking it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and in fact, I'm not sure if I do the math, I think it's very possible that the feature film version, the 1966 Batman feature film may well have been the very first movie I ever saw in a theater growing up. Oh, wow. Kid. Okay. I, I remember having trouble following the plot, but hey, give me a break. I was six years old, so you know. <laughs> and I remember watching George Reeves, you know, reruns black and white, you know, strange visitor from another planet, you know, come to Earth with powers far beyond those of mortal men. So yeah, Batman. And I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And at this point, honestly, I honestly I've been writing this for a long time. I, I like to joke. I have been writing Batman on and off since Michelle Pfeiffer was Catwoman. So. There you go. All right. How did you? How did this come about? I mean, um, you're you're uh, you're plugged into to to so much intellectual property media type stuff. Uh, I know you've been in the industry for a very long time. Do you remember how your break came about? Well, it's you know, short version is I started out you know selling short story, you know, sending out short stories and getting rejected. Uh, I went to Clarion West. Uh, back in 1984, which is a well-regarded, now, you know, venerable institution, science fiction writing workshop, which helped me hone my craft and where I also met 
a number of people who mentored me in my career. Um, but it's, I guess the short version is honestly, in terms of the tie-in stuff, I kind of came at it from the other end of the desk. Um, I used to work nine, nine to five, seven days a week as a full-time book editor for Tor Books, which is one of the major science fiction and fantasy publishers. Sure. And yeah. in fact, I started editing tie-in novels as an editor before I started writing them. Uh -huh. And well, it's a small and closely knit little world and we all know each other. So eventually, you know, I started getting, you know, calls, hey, Greg, you know, uh, we need somebody to write a Batman story by Thursday. Can you do that kind of thing? And, you know, the, the short version is I seg from being a full-time editor who wrote tie-in stories on the side on the weekends to being a full-time tie-in writer who still does a little editing for tour on the side. Okay. You still do, you still work for tour. Yeah. I am technically these days a consulting editor. So I do sort of specialized projects, you know, for them. Uh, okay. Okay, cool. Well, let's bounce around a little bit because I have some of my, my favorite things that, that I'm aware of in your career. I know, I know John does too. Um, I think the first time I was, I was aware of you was the eugenics war, uh, um, uh, con books when they came out, I seem to remember at the bookstore, they were given a very prestigious rollout. Um, and, and, uh, at that time I was less reading Star Trek anymore. That was kind of in my rear view mirror. So I didn't, I haven't checked them out and I need to, but, uh, but, uh, tell me about how that project came about and, and would it be fair to say that that was the, that was the project that put you on the map or was there something before that I'm less aware of? Oh, I don't know about putting on the map. I, that was actually, I'd written four or five Star Trek novels before that. Okay. Um, I will, however, say that, yeah, the, those books, and for those who don't know, yeah, I wrote a trilogy of novels covering the character of Khan Noonien Singh from his birth right up to the edge of the wrath of Khan. Um, I, and I will say, honestly, of all the Star Trek books I have written, and at this point, I have written many, many Star Trek books. <laughs> uh, those are the ones that honestly, people seem to remember me the most by. When I, when I go out at conventions, oh, you're the guy who wrote the con books. When I'm on Facebook, oh, you're the guy who wrote the con books. I, I Jokingly, I am more or less resigned to the fact that my obituary, when the time comes, was it Greg Cox, <laughs> who wrote the con books and many other Star Trek books, you know. Um, so yeah, those those. those but it's funny how those happen. Those happen by accident. I, this is a funny story. I had actually written an earlier book, um, Assignment Eternity, which was basically the a Return of Gary Seven book. I don't know if you remember oh, the okay, Gary yeah, Seven yeah. the original show, you know, him, you know, Kerry Gar, you know, that was meant to be a pilot for a series that never happened, where, you know, I he do remember a that. Serious yes. character named Gary Seven, who was teamed up with Roberta Lincoln, and they were going to, you know, have their own series, which never happened, which I always felt cheated of. So, indeed, high on my list of things to do when I started writing Star Trek novels was, damn it, I'm bringing back Gary Seven and Roberta Lincoln and Isis, which was their cat. Right. Um, so, I, I wrote this novel, Seven Eternity, which was basically the return of Gary Seven. And at the end of that book, I threw in just as kind of an Easter egg. Yeah, Spock idly commenting that, well, you know, we must return Gary Seven to his own time because our historical documents indicate that he and Miss Lincoln were instrumental in the overthrow of Khan Noonien Singh back in the 90s, which I thought was an effect because they were kind of contemporaries. I swear to God, this was just meant to be a kind of a cute, you know, Easter egg and a punchline to that book. I had no idea that, you know, this was going to consume my life for the next several years. But, um, but no, um, I, I turned that book in and I got a call from my editor, John Ordover, who said, you know, who, Greg, that, that final bit about Gary Seven overthrowing Khan. Yeah. You, you want to write that book? <laughs> you know, that, that's a great idea, Greg. You should write that book, which again was not, I, I just thought it was a cute Easter egg. And okay, jump ahead to the years, it's suddenly this has become a trilogy and I have spent the last three or four years writing Khan nonstop, you know. But Fantastic. it honestly started because I tossed it in as an Easter egg at the end of an earlier Star Trek novel. Right, that's very cool. I did not know that. I remember the episode I've, I've watched 
I've watched the original set many, many, many times. In fact, uh, I got confused and thought I was coming up at the end of season one. It's actually at the end of season two. So um, I was anticipating watching it a couple of days ago and, and I, I got to wait about half a month, but we'll get there again. But if I, I remember, I give credit to again, my editor, John Ordover, for spotting that bit and saying, well, Greg, that you shouldn't waste that in a throwaway line at the end of one book. You, you, you need to make that a book. And absolutely. It a trilogy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, if I remember correctly, that was a, meant to be a backdoor pilot. Yes. Uh, legend has it. Gene Roddenberry was asked to do something Doctor Who like. And I, you know, I thought that he, he put a nice spin to it. It would have been interesting to see more adventure. So uh, I'm sure it was very satisfying to kind of work that out as a fan. I, I, I without going on too much on a sideline, I, I think honestly the Doctor Who thing has been overstated. I, I, I don't think, it, you know, oh, he's obviously meant to be a Doctor Who. Right. Uh, this, this is a almost taken as gospel by modern fans, but it's only with, it's only with the benefit of hindsight that looking back, Gary Seven seems like, oh, he's obviously ripping off Doctor Who. Because honestly, right. a lot of the stuff that they're seeing came in Doctor Who later. And so, you know, honestly, in 1967, Doctor Who wasn't even a blip on the American, right. you know. Right. Yeah. The idea that he was, now Doctor Who is a global phenomenon, you know, indeed, the people point to the thing. Honestly, I think Doctor, uh, like I said, I have a whole rant here about how the assumption that somehow Gary Seven is Doctor Who is, you can see parallels, but these are fans looking back in hindsight. Yep. The, the gimmicks, you know, I think it's been established that, the, you know, Doctor Who, has his little, you know, sonic screwdriver, and Gary Seven has his, um, you know, servo device. Mm -hmm. These were introduced within weeks of each other in real time. You know, uh, yeah. I actually think that honestly, Gary, that Simon Earth is based on the day the Earth stood still. Um, to me, Assignment Earth is to the day the Earth stood still as Star Trek is to Forbidden Planet. Okay. Yeah, I um, see that. Yeah. You've got Klaatu here coming from an alien civilization to try to keep us from destroying ourselves. Uh, and also just, I think, Assignment Earth takes place in the context of the whole 60s kind of spy-fi world of the Avengers, the man from UNCLE, our man Flint, you know, you know, again, you know, um, the, the hero with the spunky female sidekick and the cool, cool gimmicks this isn't the man from uncle this is the avengers this is you know that, that, it was a thing back then yeah absolutely and yeah cute gadgets like his fountain pen that has you can use a tranquilizer is not that different from say Derek flint and his cigarette lighter with 16 different gadgets or i mean it was enough of a cliche that you know maxwell smart was parodying this with his shoe phone on get smart uh -huh, right I, I honestly think that when you look at the influences between assignment earth See, this is, I have a whole rant on the subject. You didn't know this. It, <laughs> it, I think it owes more to the 60s spy fi thing than to Doctor Who, you know? Yeah. Well, you've called me out because a phrase I like to use when I talk about old Star Trek is legend has it. But you I am aware. Correctly. And again, it's almost an article of faith. You are hardly the only person who in hindsight sees Gary Seven as your proto Doctor Who, you know? Right. And I'm aware that it, it has been blown up over time. And that's probably true of so many things when they talk about how Spock came up with the nerve pinch and, and you know, uh, how so many things happen. And I always say legend has it because it's just sort of accepted on, like you say, on faith. And probably people have told the story so many times that it's been blown up out of proportion. Probably some of the people telling those stories think that that's now how it actually happened. And you know, like you say, it, it was probably very different in in the moment. And and yes, uh, Gary Seven is extremely 60s. And I, I see all those influences as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Good point. Um, when the legend becomes the truth, print the legend. Yes. OK, there you go. Let the uh, oh, shoot. I drew um, the man who shot Liberty Valance. Yes. Bingo. Yeah. 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 Um, tell I and another one I wanted to know about. Another one I remember from seeing on the bookstore shelves a long time ago, uh, the X-Men Avengers Gamma Quest trilogy. I'm sure John wants to know a bit about that one as well, I suspect. Yeah. Um, 
That was actually published back in the 90s. It was just recently reprinted by Titan Books, by the way, in, as a big omnibus volume. But it was originally go. three paperback novels back in the 90s. And as I joke, th those books came out back before the X-Men and the Avengers were movie stars. Back before Iron Man was Robert Downey Jr. Indeed. Uh, back before the Scarlet Witch had her own TV show. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> but um, there, there was a company called Byron Price Visual Publications. They were a packager. They did deals and sold books. Uh, they, they had a license to package books based on Marvel Comics characters. I had done two Iron Man books for them. And here, this is a true behind the scenes story. They came to me asking me to write a third Iron Man book. And I said, well, gee, you know, I, I'd love to. That sounds like fun. I love Iron Man. But hey, yeah, we all know the X-Men novels sell better because this was the 90s when the X-Men were the biggest thing in the world. And again, Iron Man was not a household name yet. Um, when are you going to give me a shot at the X-Men? So, well, how about you do an Iron Man X-Men crossover? And I thought, well, I, I can do that. And then somehow, again, these things snowball. And mm. somehow it became an Avengers X-Men trilogy, which I, I wrote back in the 90s, you know. Um, and that, 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 again, it was one of these sort of collaborative things. Well, well I'd like to do the X-Men too. And so, and yeah, we ended up doing three books and they came out then. Um, I do remember that I was told I could use any six X-Men as long as Wolverine was one of them. <laughs> of course. They, well, they yeah. Wanted, they wanted Wolverine on the cover. So, um, and I do remember that the only thing I do remember there was a whole lot of just sort of collaborative haggling about, well, which Avengers were you going to use? Which X-Men were you going to use? And, you know, I had my favorites and my editor had my favorites. And um, at, at this late date, it's probably not hard to reveal that, okay, Thor was off limits simply because Byron Price, the guy who ran the company, hated Thor. <laughs> I see. Well, it's good I, you I was, knew that. I was simply, in fact, I was kind of quietly told by my editor, yeah, don't, don't even bother trying to conclude. Byron hates Thor. You know, um, so Thor was, Thor, Thor was, off, the, uh, was off limits. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, me, I, was, I, I, I filled the book of my favorites. Um, on the Avengers side, I wanted to write the Avengers I grew up with. So the Vision, the Scarlet Witch, the Beast, etc. And, you know, on the X-Men side, it was Storm. It was kind of classic X-Men, classic Avengers, you know. And of course, Iron Man and Captain America. So Absolutely. I remember there was some pressure for me to use some of the new warriors, which were then a hot comic. And I, I didn't want to use the no warriors, not that I have anything against them, but again, nostalgia, they weren't, they, oh, those are those new kids. They weren't, I didn't have the same sentimental attachment to them. Sure. I thought if this is my one and only chance to write the Avengers. I'm not going to bring in those, you know, Firestar or whoever, you know. <laughs> ah, yes, Firestar. Even, even though my editor really tried to twist my arm and even sent me a box load, I swear, he sent me a care package of new warriors comics to try to convince me to use Firestar, but... <laughs> I dug well, in my heels. Those novels were were unique enough when they came out. Did, did did they do well at the time? I think so. I mean, I you know, I'm not I'm not sure that um, you know I, I I didn't clean up on royalties on them, but um yeah, I remember they were out and they were. And I'm very very you know chuffed that they are back again because they they had their time in the sun. I never thought they'd see the light of day again. But again, Titan just recently we printed them in a whole big deluxe new volume. So that's cool that they're out there again and yeah, bound in red. That's cool. Um, back to the Clinton administration, Clinton administration, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. There aren't, I mean, there are, there are certain books that seem like they're, they're around forever, but so many more, they, they're out for a short time and then they, they have their moment and that's it. So. And now when people write to me and say, well, gee, I, I'm trying to find them, but you know, I got, you know, you don't have to go dig to used bookstores and go on eBay. I said, Oh no, no, it, you know, there's, there's, there's a brand new edition, you know? Absolutely. Wow. We I feel like there's so many topics I want to cover. I apologize for kind of just shifting gears on you, but one question I had, I, you essentially grew up a Star Trek fan. That'd be a fair comment, right? Like when it was originally, when it originally aired? I have dim memories of watching it with my dad during its original, you know, area on NBC. I remember it was a big deal that he would let me stay up past my bedtime to watch it. 
Mm -hmm. Although honestly, beyond that, of course, I grew up with the syndicated reruns of the original, you know, running constantly in the background of my childhood and adolescence. And that was that's more my experience. That's when and I have to do that. That's probably when it imprinted on me. I, I, like I said, yeah. I, you know, I, if I do the math, I was six or seven when it was on NBC. But right. it, it was a staple of running on Channel 11, you know, along with reruns of Gilligan's Island and Wild Wild West and, you know. You know, Here locally yeah. in Indianapolis, Star Trek ran constantly. It was on all the time. I know that was the case in a lot of cities, and it probably was yours as well. I'm just wondering what it, you know, looking at the phenomenon it's become since, and um, did you have any clue that it was going to continue for this long length of time or that you would uh, have the the opportunities to to play in that sandbox to the the, the extent that you have, and how, how does that feel? I you know um, it, it is like I said. There's still an inner fanboy in me when they, I get called and say, "Hey, Greg, you want to write a Planet of the Apes book?" And I, and I have to you know, oh my God, Planet of the Apes, you know, whatever you know. Um, yeah. But Star Trek, yeah, it's it, it is cool. Um, it, it's funny, one of my early writing instructors was Vonda McIntyre, who was one of the, like, you know, early generation of Star Trek writers who wrote the novelization of The Wrath of Khan yes. and The Search for Spock and The Entropy Effect. And I remember, you know, meeting Vonda, she was at another Northwest, at the scene of her conventions and being, oh, wow, she gets to write Star Trek novels. That must be so cool. Mm -hmm. Little did I know, you know. Uh, that, you know, I, I like to think of myself as a second generation Star Trek author. And, another one and, of my early mentors I should mention was David Hartwell, who is a legendary science fiction editor. He was actually the guy who launched the Star Trek book line of pocket books. That okay, was, yeah. Was still going strong. And David, you know, honestly, David changed my life. Uh, David was one of my early instructors and he was the guy who told me, hey, Greg, you know, if you're really serious about this, you have to move to New York, get a job in publishing. Uh, the phrase wasting your life in Seattle may have been used, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so, you know, but like I said, so my, my Star Trek connections go way back. In fact, another one of my early writing teachers was Norman Spinrad. Sure. Who wrote the Doomsday Machine. So, right. you know, I, I kind of come by this naturally, I, you know, I, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, Vonda and Norman, and David all mm -hmm. sort of, you know, encourage me and, so, you know, in fact, uh, I was one more story. The very first panel I ever did at a science fiction convention, when I was uh -huh. just a fledgling little author who'd had a couple stories published in Amazing Stories magazine, was with Theodore Sturgeon, who, among other things, sure, wrote sure. Amok Time and you know, Shore Leave on Star right. Trek. I, I remember I, being very intimidated. Oh my God, this is the guy who invented Pon Far, and they're putting me on a panel with him. I just watched that episode the other night. That's actually where I am. And I must say he was yeah. very, very encouraging and welcoming and generous to, again, a nervous newbie author who had never been on a panel before and had, at that point, a couple of short story credits to his name. So Yeah. You would mentioned one of my favorites. Uh, Vonda McIntyre was a guest of honor at a convention I went to in the 90s, and she let me gush over her and say some very kind words about her her novelizations and her handling of the character of Savick, which for me at that time i thought was was absolutely marvelous i thought she was a great new character i was looking forward to all the wonderful things i thought that character would end up doing and of course it it didn't didn't quite work out but i i so enjoyed her take on that character and and what she brought to it so yeah, like I said, you know, I, I grew up in this stuff. I grew up reading tie-ins and reading novelizations and, you know, so yeah, I, I'm still sort of thrilled that I get to do this now. And again, sort of like I knew some of the early authors, you know, so I, I consider myself as carrying in a grand tradition, you know, um, not just with, not just with Star Trek, but also with Planet of the Apes and other things, you know, that. Absolutely. I grew up reading the novelizations of all the Planet of the Apes movies, and hey, I got to write one. So now I am part of this chain that includes David Gerald, Jerry Purnell, you know, Michael Avalone, you know, John Jakes, etc. So, absolutely, I, I I know John has a good follow up question on this. I I'm gonna cue him up here. Yeah. So uh, as a writer. Uh, of 
Star Trek novels and as a fan of the universe. Where do you see the future of the Star Trek universe headed? And how do you feel about the recent series that have landed on Paramount Plus? Oh, I'm really enjoying the new stuff. It's, it's great to have a whole new wave of Star Trek coming. And, you know, I am counting the days in particular for Strange New Worlds, which I'm really excited about, you know. Um, you finally get to learn more about, you know, Pike and number one and, you know, that whole crew and that whole era, which we've written some novels about over the years, but this is, you know, largely unexplored territory. Absolutely. Um, and now finding out that we just recently found out that young Cadet Urura and young Christine Chapel and Dr. Mabenga, oh my God, Dr. Mabenga are gonna be on Strange New Worlds, you know, so. For those who don't remember, Dr. Mabenga was the other doctor aboard Kirk's Enterprise who we only saw in two episodes, you know. I thought it was more than that, but it may have only been two. You're probably no, honestly, right. believe it or not, yeah. You know, we, we, and of course, we've used him extensively in the books, but no, he, 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 he was only in two. He was in Private Little War and oh, um, that which survives. Yeah, that he Private Little War, I particularly it. remember. Yeah, because he has a he has a major part trying to break Spock out of his trance and and such. Yeah, I, I can I confess to when they announced that Doctor Mabinga was coming back, I was like, oh right, from you know. Private Little War and Private Little War and um, that other one. What's right. the other one? And I had to go to Memory Alpha to you know refresh my memory. What was the other one he was in? You know, it was so much easier when there was much less Star Trek, right? Um, <laughs> but you know, yeah, but yeah, I think he's probably most memorable in Private Little War. But yeah, no, apparently he also popped up in uh, that which survives, which is the one with Lee Merriweather you know, flipping in and out, you know, I yep. am for you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you said, uh, um, again, we're just kind of bouncing all over the place. Uh, so thank you for, for dealing with me. But um, you said something in the Star Trek 2. Oh, for those that don't know, if you have the Star Trek 2 DVD, there's an extra on there where they they interview Greg. And I, I apologize. I don't remember the other media tie-in person about being a media tie-in author julia eklar that's yes okay and then um you made an interesting comment about how writing media tie-in works for things like star trek are 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 kind of a, a touch and go area because you don't know if what you write could end up being canon or not because sometimes those things get contradicted later on in the official storylines has has is that the sort of thing that has that sort of thing happened to you yet as far as anything oh, that you would put down absolutely i mean like i said you know the, the the books are the books and the show the show ultimately the tail does not wag the dog the 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 media versions the episodes the movies they set continuity we fall after it and yeah, invariably, every time you write a tie-in novel, it's an occupational hazard that there could be a new episode that would render, you know, this or that book apocryphal. Right. This happened throughout the history of Star Trek. It will happen again. Um, but indeed, one funny example of this, uh, Underworld. There's the Underworld series. There was right. a series of horror movies with Kate Beckinsale, Vampires versus Lycans. Um, I, I did the novelizations of the first three movies, and I also did an original novel set in the universe. Now, the funny part is when we, the original novel, Blood Enemy, was, was I wrote right after the first movie came out. And indeed, at that time, they told me, well, tell you what, Greg, so we don't interfere with the continuity of the future movies, why don't you do a prequel? Why don't you do a prequel to explain how the Lycan Vampire War got started? Uh -huh. And at that time, I think the idea was, let's go back and do that because we're not going to do that in the movies. And that way <laughs> I would not step on their toes. Okay, jump ahead a few years and we get movie three, Underworld 3, Rise of the Lycans, which is exactly that plot. <laughs> Whoops. And it was very funny. I got a call from my editor that one day. It's Lessinger. And he was like, Greg, I just got in the script for the, um, you know, third in Underworld movie, and well, Greg, um, it pretty much completely eradicates your, your original novel, you know? And he kind of, it was funny, I think he was more embarrassed about this than I was. He kind of hemmed and hawed a bit, and it was like, Ed, are, are you asking me if I would have any trouble writing 
a novelization that completely obliterates my previous novel? <laughs> my answer is, when do you need to buy it? How much are you paying? Okay, you know. There you go, right. But it was funny, because no, I ended up writing, so I ended up writing the novelization of the book, which rendered my previous Underworld prequel. <laughs> Whoops. So I, have written, I... Two, I, have, I have written two mutually contradictory prequels to Underworld. <laughs> and this is hilarious because I remember I did get some confused responses. There was one guy on Amazon who was like, you know, in all caps, Greg Cox, make up your mind. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it, it's an occupational hazard. You know, um, you, you know, the, the, these things are evolving. Things change. And like I said, you grow up reading comic books, you understand that, you know, Earth 1, Earth 2, Earth 3 continuities get rewritten. Nothing is set in stone, you know. You just hope that your stories, you know, people enjoy your stories when they come out and hopefully keep reading them even when they're not, quote, official anymore, you know. Right. So did you come at all close or was it, did they just take a completely different angle than you had originally picked? Completely different angle. Okay. Oh. Um, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but I was, I was funny is about it is, again, I think when originally, when they, it was their idea, the movie people, I mean, to, for me to do a prequel, because I think at that point it was like, they, they still weren't sure what they were gonna do with the second Underworld movie. So, so that I didn't step on their toes, well, why don't you just go back and do a prequel? So, mm -hmm. you know, to leave us more elbow room. Well, at that point, none of us knew that the third movie was gonna end up being a prequel. So- Right, right, right. And so, but yeah, I've, I've written two mutually contradictory prequels. That, 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 that must've been uh, a very interesting experience, well, I would imagine. But hey, you got paid twice to write about the same material, right? Well, actually, it's very funny. There's a character, Sonia. Um, spoiler alert, she dies. Um, hmm. I have written the death of Sonia three times now. <laughs> As a flashback in the first movie, yeah, I, it, and again in the prequel, my first prequel, and again in my second prequel, it's like, okay, time to kill off Sonia one more time. <laughs> yeah. Of course, Sonia, I've killed her three times now. Okay. <laughs> well, she's a, she a vampire or a werewolf? Vampire. Oh, well, then, you know, they... She figured it out, I guess. So this is another completely off the wall question. And I'm just curious. Um, let me set this up a little bit. I, my best of my memory is I believe you, you reached out and, and sent me a friend request maybe about a year and a half ago. When I, when I looked at it, I'm like, I feel like I should know that name. I really need to find out who this is. It was pretty cool, but almost immediately like we were talking about the same stuff in the same way it's like we had all these interests in universal monsters and we were watching a lot of the same movies and we kind of had the same it was like having a big brother pretty much you know and that was before um i really was fully aware that i i had seen your books and i i i, I should have i should have been i should have known who you were better than I did but I, I caught up really quick and I was like oh my gosh not only do we have all this stuff in common but we have uh he's he's like he's one of those Star Trek uh writers that that uh I was reading back in the 80s and, and enjoying so much um it just was bad timing that I wasn't reading those as much as you were getting fully into it and now I got some catching up to do and that's that's just the truth but you and I keep mentioning um Richard Matheson and uh, I have to wonder, what was it like to edit Richard Matheson, knowing how much you admire him as, as a writer? Well, yeah, like in the context here, in my capacity as a tour editor, yeah, I was the, I was Richard Matheson's editor at tour for 20 plus years or so. And for those who don't know, again, Richard Matheson, legendary science fiction writer. Uh, yes. I, I used to do a whole shtick at tour sales conferences about how even if you don't recognize his name, you know his work. Yep. The Incredible yeah, Shrinking true. Man, I Am Legend, Somewhere in Time, The Night Stalker, Duel, you know, the Twilight Zone episode with the gnome gremlin on the wing of the plane, you yes. know, I could, you know, What Dreams May Come, Stir of Echoes, Real Still. I, I am, and at this point, you know, Pavlovian about plugging Richard every time, chance I got. <laughs> but and yeah, Richard's another person I can't believe that I grew up reading his work, um, that I ended up being his editor was one of these things I could never have predicted. Um, but no, I, it, it was great. I will, I will mention the first time I edited Richard, it was for a book called Seven Steps to Midnight. I was in fact a little intimidated. Yeah, who am I to 
offer editorial advice to Richard Matheson, who was writing classic novels literally before I was born. You know, uh, The Incredible Shrinky Man, I Am Legend, etc. But no, I, I gotta say- Lots of favorites um, in there. Yeah, in all defense, Richard, I mean, Richard was never a Prinama. He was very, we, we had a nice relationship for 20 years. Um, he took advice, we would go back and forth. In fact, I kind of, in retrospect, I think I kind of was a little too ginger on the first book a little bit. You know, after we got the first book, I was much more comfortable. Oh, well, how about, let's do this, let's do, you know, very interactive. Now, the funny thing is I only met him in the flesh once because he lived in California, I lived on the East Coast. And, but yeah, we met only in the flesh once and that was at a world horror convention in uh, Connecticut. And I remember it was a wonderful night. We, 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 we were snowbound. We were literally, was, I, I think of this as the Donner Party convention because there was a blizzard outside. No one could leave the hotel. We were all starving to death because the coffee shop was only open three hours a day. But we, there was a fireplace going on in the lobby and we sat up one night just working out the plot points in you know, one of his upcoming novels. And it was a you know, great evening, which I remember fondly. That must have been very, very cool. Yeah. Um, and like I said, we talked, you know, uh, Richard did not do email, so we communicated by letters and correspondence and phone calls for, for 20 plus years or so. Uh, that that must, just must have been super neat. So uh, that's one of the topics I know you and I will, will chat about all the time. Um, it just... I've noticed the way you use social media very much the same way I do. Uh, try to try to make it fun and positive and talking about uh, just being a fan and having fun with it and, and getting into those obscure topics and, and uh, you know, making it a conversation. Um, I don't know what your experience is. I've had a lot of really positive experiences with social media and I know a lot of people haven't, but situations like this don't happen. Um, where we have someone of your stature on our show because we've we've had a connection, you know, uh, for the past year and a half on Facebook, just talking about fan things and, and having a good time with it. And I have all all kinds of uh, really positive experiences from Facebook, even though there are certainly plenty of negative ones as well. But I feel like, you know, it's social media can be a tool it's what you make of it and and trying to keep it as positive as possible I, I end up having all these great experiences with my heroes and stuff and I'm wondering if if is that something is that something uh would you agree with that statement or or yeah. how, how do you see this before we leave Richard Matheson behind though I want to actually Don and I should probably actually connect the dots and point out that Richard also wrote one of the original classic Star Trek episodes the enemy yes was Split into his good and evil half. So again, as I keep saying, even if you don't know Richard's name, you know, oh right, the, the Star Trek episode where Kirk splits into his good and evil half. That was Richard. So again, like I said, the Star Trek connections, it's all absolutely. Know, yeah. Back, yeah, yeah. Back and forth, you know. Uh, oddly enough, Richard and I almost never talked about Star Trek. I kind of regret that we never sat down because most of the time when we were talking on the phone, it was about, you know, deadlines and deliveries and stuff we never sort of sat down and schmoozed about Star Trek. I, mm -hmm. I think he mentioned once to me that he only did one Star Trek because he kind of generally preferred writing for anthology shows where he could create his own characters rather than kind of a series thing. But I, right. I, I now honestly regret that we didn't, I never you know, picked his brains about Star Trek more. But yeah, hmm. about, about you know, social media is kind of what you make of it. I, I find, especially as I get older, it's easier said than done. I try to resist getting sucked into you know, long debates. It's hard. I hey, I, easier said than done. We all do it. You know. Um, sure. But and I am not. I confess, I am guilty of the oh God, someone is wrong on the internet syndrome. You know, just factually, I can't resist fact checking the internet. It's someone goes, oh, you know, Bela Gosi was great as Frankenstein. You know, was great <laughs> as the Mummy. I'm going, no, no, that was Boris Karloff. Although I try to say it politely, you know. Mm -hmm. Or if someone says that, you know. Harry Seven is based on Doctor Who. I may, I may feel compelled to jump in. Legend <laughs> has it. <laughs> but, you know, that being said, there's ways of doing it without attacking the person or, you know, getting, you know. And also, I find the older I get, I, I, I tend to resist threads that are simply of the, 
what's the worst thing you've ever seen or what's your worst movie you've ever seen or who is the worst actor on Star Trek if it's just, and there's, you know, I mean, yeah, we all, yeah, we all like to bash things. I've bashed, like, there are movies I have bashed in my time. Hi, Van Helsing, but, but, you know, <laughs> um, but, you know. I, I'm it, with you there, it, yeah. Sort of relent- I remember one day going on a Trek DVS and noticing that the most popular threads were like, you know, what is the, what is your least favorite Voyager episode? Who is the worst actor? Like, yeah, you know, why, why? These days I'm just more inclined to go, oh, wow, Valley of Guanji. I love Valley of Guanji. Let's talk about Ray Harryhausen. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, again, I'm not a saint. I, I, I get sucked into pointless debates too. Okay. And there, I've got my red buttons, you know, um, or, or, you know, or hot buttons, but, you know, I try more and more these days to just sort of go to jump in and go, yeah, yeah, you know, Kolchak, yay, Star Trek, yay, you know, right. Warehouse 13 and talk about stuff I love rather than, you know, for example, the other day, I'll give an example. This was me showing, you know, I confess, um, I am not a big fan of the original Battlestar Galactica. I, I have my reasons. Mm-hmm. But the other day, it was the anniversary of it was something, the somethingth anniversary of the debut of the original 1970s Battlestar Galactica. And all over Facebook, people were posting memes about it and yay, yay. And, and you know, I just abstained. It, you know, you know, why rain on somebody else's parade? You know? Sure, sure. It, it, that's one of the negatives of Facebook I, I don't understand. It's like, oh, everybody's celebrating the 20th anniversary of Battlestar Galactica. Not one of my faves, but so yeah, I'm just... It's really weird when you see someone like, you know, what's your favorite comic book? I hate comic books. Well, well, thanks for playing. You know, <laughs> uh, you know we, we did to know that, you know. Yeah. I think we all need to remember that everything that pops up in your thread is not necessarily directed at you. You know, mm-hmm. oh, you know. There are topics also I know nothing about. I am totally clueless and ignorant about anime. And that's not a judgment call. Honestly, it's a generational thing. I didn't grow up on it. Sure. I'm sure anime is wonderful. So yeah, when I see friends posting about anime, I just, oh, this, you know, you know, my response is not required here, you know. Right, right. I will scroll on and, you know, oh, good, you know, oh, here's a thread on Hammer Dracula movies. That, and right. try not to be the guy who jumps in and goes, vampires are stupid, you know, I'm sick of vampires. Well, again, thank you for playing. This is a Hammer Dracula thread. I don't know. Right. <laughs> why we needed you to tell us that you think vampires are stupid or, you know, whatever. I, I try not to be that guy, you know. No, absolutely. I, I hear you. And I, and I've got my hot buttons. I know John knows my hot buttons and I know his too. And, and, you know, we all get sucked in every now and again, but. Um... I will actually tell you what my hot button is. Hmm. My hot button is whenever somebody claims to speak for all the fans. Yes. And sort of, you know, presents their view as, you know, well, you know, all true Star Trek fans hate the new movies. And I'm always like, speak for yourself, dude. You are entitled to your opinion, but don't, you know, Trekkies right. are a opinionated and argumentative bunch. We don't agree on anything. So right. That, that, that's one of my hot buttons. I always feel obliged to jump in. Well, you know, all true Star Trek fans who grew up watching the original series hate Discovery. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, dude, you know, speaking as an old timer here too, don't, don't lump me in with you. Okay, so. Well, thank you for saying that, I have to say, because I am a Star Trek fan who enjoyed the, the new movies. I'm not saying that they were the greatest, but I don't have the uh, disdain for them that others have, and that's fine. You can not like them, and I can like them, and we can all get along and, and you know, live happily, but... Um, I, I feel you on that because I, I hate when people are, you know, so uh, I'm I'm right, you're wrong, your opinion sucks, you know, who are you? And, and you know, everyone has an opinion about things and it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're giving it that you're bashing someone else for their love of it, of it, you know, what you don't like. Uh, you know, it's just a varying of the of opinions. I mean, you know, it's not it's not meant to be heavy handed. Some people do uh, act heavy handed about it, as you pointed out, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because I hate that too. 
I, I admit that that's the thing which occasionally will suck me into getting into a sort of, if somebody claims to be, I see someone speaking for me or my generation or, you know, well, every true, you know, the whole true fan thing needs to have a stake to at heart, you know. And I, I admit, you know, it's not just a Star Trek thing. I, I still remember the guy who, you know, told me that, you know, oh, well, all truths, you're, you're not a real Superman fan. I'm going, dude, you weren't even born when I was watching George, Re George Reeves back in, you know, my old black and white TV, you know, don't tell me I'm not a real Superman fan, you know, because I disagree with you on something, you know. Right. And um, I like guess that's why when I get, and then, I, and then an hour passes and I realize, Jesus, I could have been writing. Why am I arguing with somebody, you know? Yeah, that, that getting sucked into those debates is definitely a time consumer and time is your most valuable resource and you end up wasting it on something that really doesn't even matter. Uh, and I can, I can totally relate to that. Uh, that's why uh, I tend to try and stay away from social media. Uh, I'll see something and it'll be like, uh, yeah, keep, I'm going to keep scrolling because it's not not um, anything that I feel like I a need to engage in, and b it's not going to be uh, anything that's uh, you know that means anything. You know, getting into senseless debates about opinions to me is just kind of a waste of time. Especially since nine times out of ten, you're not going to change anybody's minds. You know, um, exactly. If somebody thinks discovery is an abomination and a slap in the face of the fans and and, and you know is, is spitting on Giovanni's grave, you're not going to change their minds. Okay, so you know exactly, exactly. And oh, by the way, speaking of social media, I, I sent you out a friend request. Oh, I will I, I will keep an eye out for that. Okay, thank, and thank you. you for alerting me because I'm actually kind of I've never developed a good system for processing friend requests. You know. Okay. On the flip side, though, I will say what I, I very much enjoy when the Robert Sawyers and the David Geralds and the Greg Coxes engage in fan conversation. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, all, we're all fans. We, I, I, you know, talking about this stuff and debating and, and you know, talking about our favorite episodes and this. Kind and of, of course, I'm yeah, talking about when we keep it civil and we keep it smart. Yeah. <laughs> As long as it's not a holy war, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. But um, I, I just, it, it is so neat to see that the people that you admire are also fans and they like to get down into discussing which Dracula appealed to them the most and that sort of thing that, you know, when you take the time to, to make that kind of connection uh, with the public, I do think that that does count for something as well. Um, and I very much enjoy those dialogues with with my heroes and that's that's been a very much a positive thing with social media for me that uh you know who would have who would have thought you know what i mean um that we'd have this kind of engagement uh at this time well again david gerald who i you know i i've actually again another person i've only met in the flesh once but have been talking to for years and everything you know if you had told me as a kid that i be Facebook friends with the guy who invented dribbles, you know, or right. many, among many other things. <laughs> and who, in fact, you know, wrote the novelization for Battle for, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, among many other things, you know. Yes. So. He seems to have like a whole second writing career that, that not many people are all that aware of that yeah. I, I very much enjoy. I, I, in the 80s, I was very much into his couture books and, and those sorts of things. They were they were wonderful for me. I remember reading When Harley Was One. Yes. And beyond that, honestly, and I hope I'm not going to make, if David Gerald ever hears this, and I hope I don't make him feel old, that, no, I remember in junior high, I devoured his nonfiction books on Star Trek. He did two of them. He wrote a yep. book on like the world of Star Trek, where he sort of analyzed how the series worked. And he wrote a separate book about just the making of the trouble with triples and I, I read those books to pieces you know and still think of some of the terminology he used his, some of his advice about storytelling in those books you know I've, I've still got those on my shelf yep I do I do still check them out every now and then yeah and I remember I think I must have been junior high I think that I discovered those books and read them back and forth you know so yeah and you know uh 
I ex- I've exchanged PMs with the guy and we've, we've, we've been on threads together. It's just, it is such a, it's such an amazing world we live in that you, we can do that sort of thing. Um, Bizarrely, the one and only time I've ever met him in the flesh, we had lunch in Glasgow, Scotland of all places. <laughs> <laughs> That'd have been hard to predict. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a world con, uh, you know, and we ended up having lunch in Glasgow um, many, many years ago. The Two Towers Talk Show is sponsored in part by OG Nerds, a new social media community dedicated to nerds of a certain age, 40 and over, although all are welcome. Members are encouraged to share articles and links on their favorite nerdy topics such as animation, anime, art, books, writing, comics, manga, Movies, music, sports, tech, science, TV, video games, RPGs, and more. Be sure to visit them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The Two Towers Talk Show is sponsored in part by Showtime Cinema in Mooresville, Indiana. Their friendly staff is always willing to go the extra mile to make your movie-going experience an enjoyable and memorable one. Enjoy the comfort of their new cushioned seating in their spacious auditoriums, And while you're there, be sure to stop by the concession stand and purchase some popcorn where real butter topping is an option. They're located at 300 South Bridge Street in Mooresville, Indiana. We hope to see you at the movies.